Isian from ICTP. Hello, yes, that is me. So let me. Who will speak about uh, analog of many body very SN theorem for uh, critical systems? Uh, yes, yeah, so Karen, so uh, the, floor's, the floor is yours. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and thanks the organizers for the, for the opportunity to, to present my work, our work. <laughs> so it is going to be about a extension and analog of a quantum many body Berry Essen theorem uh, and with the aim to extend it to, to critical systems. So uh, I should just upfront let you know that this is going to be a little bit orthogonal to perhaps most of the talks uh, during this conference because it is not uh, condensed matter per se, but well, hopefully it will be of some interest to you. So uh, this is a paper that has appeared on archive already and it is, uh, it is work done in collaboration with, uh, with people from Denmark, Matthias Jorgensen, Gabriel Landi, Alvaro Alhambra, Jonathan Brask and Marti Pernau Yobe from Geneva. So, uh, well, the, the point of the talk is going to be a many body system, a generic many body system. So imagine a chair, it, it truly fascinates me that you can say so many general nice things even about a chair. So, uh, well, it's, it's Hamiltonian is going to be some short range interacting Hamiltonian, which will consist of some atoms, A and K, and they are going to interact somehow. And each atom is going to have um, uh, an, uh, a self potential. So we're going to have this Hamiltonian and very little can in general be said about this Hamiltonian if we look at it as, as, as just an operator. No, I mean, it's going to be a complicated Hamiltonian with a very complicated spectrum. But the fact that uh, the spectra of Hamiltonians are, are complicated, of generic Hamiltonians are complicated, is not really related to the fact that these Hamiltonians are complicated. Even if you take something very simple, such as the quantum Ising model, which is very easily solvable, uh, its spectrum is, is still very complicated. Now, uh, if we want to nevertheless be able to say some things about the uh, about the spectra, about the energy distributions of, of the systems, of, of pretty much all many body systems, right? Then we need to uh, become interested in other kinds of quantities. Uh, so if we imagine that our many body system is in some state raw, then uh, let's look at its cumulative uh, energy distribution. So it is basically this object, right? Which is basically the sum of the probabilities of all energy levels that are below E. So basically, what is the probability that I have an energy that is somewhere from zero to E, where I say that the ground state has energy zero because it's arbitrary, we can be set to arbitrary number and we can choose it to be zero. So if it turns out when we ask this, when we ask questions about this JE, about the cumulative distribution, then things become very easy. Well, not, not, not very easy, but, but nevertheless, one can say things. Right, so uh, the non-critical Berry Essen theorem that has been proven in this uh, a bit older work by Brandau and Kramer uh, regards general lattice systems. So imagine you have a lattice which has n sites, and uh, the Hamiltonian is just a sum of of n terms, the sum of h nu's, right, and so there are going to be several assumptions in Hamiltonian. So for first assumption is going to be that the Hamiltonian is, is finite range, which means that if we take the uh, vertex V, right, uh, then uh, this particle V is going to interact only with neighbors, right? Only not necessarily nearest neighbors. So for example, on this graph, I, I represented next to nearest neighbor interactions, basically, right? And each H nu is going to be either at most next to nearest neighbor interacting. I mean, it, you, you, can, you may have a particle that doesn't interact. So, so the Hamiltonian doesn't even have to be translation invariant, but all the local terms have to be upper bounded. So uh, yes. Now, so this is, this is the uh, requirements on the, on the Hamiltonian. As you, as you may notice, uh, this, these are very weak requirements because it's basically it doesn't even require you know, translation invariance and nothing. You, you, just, you just need to have short range interactions. Now, coming back to state, uh, 
the requirement on the state is the following. So imagine you have two regions, this one and this one, let's call them arbitrarily A and B regions. Uh, then we want the correlations between these two regions to be exponentially decaying, which is quantified in this following way. So rho is the state of the, of the whole many body system and A and B are operators are, that are localized on regions A and B respectively. So A lives in A, B lives in B. Uh, so this is the correlation. This is the correlator between them. And this is normalized with the, with the norms of A and B because well, basically we keep A and B arbitrary. arbitrary. So the point of this uh, equation is that uh, the correlations between any observables localized to these regions is going to be upper bounded by this exponent where DAB is the distance between the regions A and B and psi is going to be basically the correlation length, right? So just uh, for, for future convenience, let me denote uh, this trace with rho as just, you know, this averaged uh, brackets, right? So this is just a notation. And the other and last requirement on assumption about the system is that this, this quantity mu squared that I define as variance, which in turn is defined as the standard deviation of the Hamiltonian should be proportional to, to N, right? Now, if you notice these two, these two things are essentially statements about the system being non-critical because if it was critical, then this psi would diverge, then the, the variance would diverge because it, it, it gives the heat capacity and this kind of things. Right, so basically we have a non-critical arbitrary system. Then it can be shown that the energy distribution, so this is the cumulative energy distribution of, of the system. And this GE is the cumulative distribution of the Gaussian distribution. So, so we have a normal distribution, which is just the exponent, right? And then we take it cumulative distribution and we can show that the maximal distance between these two cumulative distributions goes to zero as n goes to infinity, right? Because this is just a logarithm over, over n and, and this, this always goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And this d is the spatial dimensionality of the lattice. Maybe I forgot to mention that the lattice can be arbitrarily dimensional. Now, so, so this, is a, this is a pretty powerful result that says that pretty much any non-critical system is just a Gaussian. Basically, you just, uh, despite the fact that the, the spectra are very, very complicated, essentially, if you just look at the average energy, then the, the whole distribution of energy is going to be just a Gaussian distribution around the average. Now, if we become interested in, in critical systems, right? This, this result was about non-critical systems, then, then, then what can be said in this case? Can, can, can we say anything general in this situation? So what we were able to find is, is the following. So if you uh, limit yourself to only thermal states, uh, to finite temperature phase transitions and translation invariant lattices, so, so you don't take uh, arbitrary Hamiltonian, you, you take a translation invariant Hamiltonian and uh, you ask questions about uh, your phase transition takes place at, at finite temperature and well, and, and, and the state of the system is thermal. Now, um, to, to somehow approach uh, this problem, I will, I'm going to give you a, a bird's eye view on the proof of our result, which is going to be basically a step-by-step -step introduction to the result itself. So now the relevant quantities start with the, with the spectral density, right? Now in analogy with the, with the cumulative energy distribution, we can just ask how many energy levels are there below the value of energy E, right? So this is this gamma E. It is going to be the cumulative spectral density, right? And of course, uh, we can immediately define the spectral density, the normal, the, the usual spectral density as a derivative of the cumulative de uh, spectral density, right? And of course, it is going to be this, this quantity that gives you uh, the amount of energy levels in, in a small window around the value E, right? So this, this delta N is the amount of levels and this is the energy window. Now, uh, if we take a thermal state, so as I said, we're going to limit ourselves to, to thermal states. 
then we can define the energy distribution of this system, which is, which is obviously the derivative of the cumulative distribution, right, as, as this quantity. So this e to the minus beta ez tells you the, the probability of almost all or almost any level in the window because the window is small. So, so almost all of these guys have the same probability. So this is the probability. And this omega e gives you the number of, of energy levels in the window. So this QE is going to be the energy distribution of the system, right? Now, with these definitions, uh, we invoke the following, uh, again, quite powerful result, which is due to Mueller, Adlam, Massanes, Wiebe. Uh, it's again from 2015. So now uh, it says the following thing. So if U, is the energy density and un is of course then then the value of energy right if we take the uh, cumulative um, uh, energy uh, sorry spectral density here and take the logarithm of the amount of states that are below this value of energy and look at its density right then in the thermodynamic limit it is going to converge to the canonical uh, entropy, right? So, so this, this, this sounds a little bit either trivial or completely obscure, but, but let, me, let, let me just explain what, what this little formula actually means, right? So, so first of all, the regime of validity is that it holds at and above the critical point. So below a critical point, uh, your equilibrium is not going to be a Gibbs state, right? It's not going to be of this form. It is going to be a KMS state and below the critical point, you have multiple phases and, and none of them is described by, by, by a, I'm sorry, thermal equilibrium, right? So, so you need to be either exactly at the critical point or above. So this is, this is the range of validity of this formula, right? Now this U, as I said, is already the energy density. So we, we just set a threshold here. This SU is the density of canonical entropy corresponding to average energy density U. Now this, this this part is tricky. Although this this these two u's are this have the same value, they they are different things, right? In one case, for for the entropy, this u is is the uh, average energy of a canonical ensemble. So it is an average energy that that this thermal state would give you, and this is the entropy that would correspond to this average energy density, right? And this just gives you the um, the threshold below which you count the, the amount of energies, am amount of energy levels. <clears throat> now, okay, the, the physical meaning of this thing is that this, this logarithm of, of the amount of energy levels below a certain energy level is kind of the microcanonical entropy density at energy U, energy density U, right? And, and this equation, this equality, expresses the equivalence between canonical and microcanonical ensembles, because this is basically the density of microcanonical entropy, and this is the density of, of canonical entropy. And we, we see that in thermodynamic limit, they, they converge. So for translationally invariant, short range interaction, interacting systems, the canonical and microcanonical ensembles are equivalent both at and away criticality, well, above criticality. So, so how, how are we making, how are we going to make use of this fact, right, for our needs? Now, again, we recall the, the formula for, for energy density. This, this, is, this is the quantity that we are trying to find out, right? So it is given by, by, by this object. And using the formula for, for omega e, right, because again, so let, let me remind that the omega is the derivative of gamma. Now we have the gamma. So we can find the omega by taking the, the derivative, right? And so we will arrive at the following formula. So you have these, the, the energy probability distribution for energy. Uh, this, this U is the energy density. And this object here is basically the, the free energy minus this free energy functional. <clears throat> Now here, let me invo invoke the, the standard thermodynamic equilibrium condition, right? So we know that the equilibrium in thermodynamics is achieved for, for, for the minimum of the free energy, right? So if we take the, the, 
the free energy density functional, which is energy minus T times the entropy, right? And then we minimize over all U's, then we're going to obtain the free energy, right? Wait, sorry. <clears throat> now, um, if we look more carefully at this expression, we will find that its expansion around the value of energy that delivers the minimum is going to be, of course, the Fn beta is going to be the, the free energy, which appears here. Plus, I'm sorry, here, here it has to be a plus, not a minus. Plus, because this is a minor, uh, this, this is a minimum. Plus this, this object, which, which, is, which is completely positive, right? It's just a square of, of energies. And the Cn beta is the specific heat. And this Un beta is again, the canonic energy density. Okay, so, so this is going to be the, the main formula around which the, our result is built, right? And um, basically, this is basically this, this Taylor expansion. We continue this Taylor expansion till the end and then estimate all the terms and thereby obtain a non perturbative upper bound on this difference here, right? So, so the results are as follows. Now, uh, before formulating the results, let me, let me just remind you about the critical exponents that, 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 that we have in uh, finite temperature phase transitions. So uh, if this is the specific heat, then when approaching, to the, when approaching the, the critical point, critical temperature, it's going to diverge with some exponent alpha, right? And since, since any many body system has actually finite amount of, of constituents, so n is finite, right? There cannot be a true infinity, right? So if we look at the scaling of C of, of the specific heat at the point of phase transition where it should formally be infinite, it should have a diverging scaling with n, right? Now it is, it is quite you know, standard in textbooks. It, it can be found in textbooks. It's standard knowledge more or less that when alpha is equal to zero, so formally we see no divergence here, the specific heat actually diverges logarithmically with n, right? So, so when alpha is equal to zero, then we have logarithmic divergence. When alpha is larger than zero, then we have polynomial divergence or algebraic divergence, depending on the term. So this is this uh, uh, exponent determined by alpha. Now, uh, the Barry Essen theorem that, that, that we find for, uh, for alpha equal to zero is the following. So when the energy departs from the average only as square root of the logarithm of the variance of H. So, so this is the, the standard deviation of the energy. And then when we depart from the average square root of logarithm N times the the variation, right? Then the energy distribution is proportional to, to a Gaussian. So, so basically in this range, it is just a Gaussian, right? You, you just you see from this expression with a one over logarithm n correction. Basically, this, this is this thing. And whenever uh, we're outside of this range, uh, whenever the energy is farther from the average than the square root of logarithm n times the, the standard deviation. Oh, sorry. Then the total probability contained in that region, which is formally not necessarily Gaussian, is proportional to one over n. So it is, it is a very small probability. Now, uh, basically we have a, a quite complete specification of the, uh, of the, of the probability distribution. And, and we see it is essentially Gaussian whenever it is relevant, right? Now, uh, this can be actually tested numerically uh, for, for an exactly solvable model. And 2D Ising model is a paradigmatic example of the case where alpha is equal to zero, right? Because it's free energy can be computed exactly. There is a, there is a, there is a, a, a formula for finite N and, uh, and of course, taking the derivative of the free energy gives you access to all the moments of the energy. So they all can be calculated. And if 
uh, you know, kappa n is the nth cumulant of, of, of energy, right? If we take this quantifier of non-Gaussianity, right? Basically, we just take the cumulant, we, 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 we kind of normalize, bring it to, 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 to the zero level, and then compare it with the, with the second cumulant, because the variance is just the second cumulant brought again to the zero, uh, to, to, to the ground zero level, which is basically the, the this is kappa two to the power of one half, right? So now this, this quantity is proportional to one over logarithm, square root of logarithm n. So basically when n goes to infinity, all the non-Gaussianity measures go to zero, right? For, for, for the Ising model. So for, uh, like we see this general result somehow manifest itself also when, when you look at exact numerics, well, I'm not showing any plots, but this is what the numerics show that uh, indeed for, for also for this exactly solvable example, we have that uh, the uh, distribution is Gaussian. Right, now <clears throat> when, when alpha is strictly larger than zero, uh, there is unfortunately not much that can be said about QE except that it is picked around the average energy and is decaying exponentially at the tails. So this is related to the following fact. So if we look at this formula, which I now realize that that is a bit cumbersome, but, but so this is the free energy. This is the minimized free energy, if you look at it. And this guy is the non-minimized free energy. This is the free energy functional around the minimum, right? When U is the, is the uh, canonical value, then this, this guy turns into this guy, right? Now, it can be rigorously proven that, that this object is strictly concave with U, right? Which means that once you go further from, from, from the minimum, you are inexorably becoming larger and larger, and the derivative is also growing. This means that, that whenever this U minus, when, whenever this, this free energy functional is further from, from the minimum, from its minimum by some, some, by any delta, then we know that the Q is going to be e to the minus beta n times delta. So, so basically it's going to be an exponential decay of Q once we go farther from, from the minimum. So basically this is, this is the, uh, this is all the information that you can, can get from, from, from this generic um, expression from the, from the QE. And uh, maybe, maybe there can be, other things said about alpha larger than zero, but, but basically this is, this is all we, we have been able to find out. So basically in all cases for, for any situation, you know that your QE, your distribution is a unimodal distribution that, that decays quickly at the tails. And you can prove that for alpha equals to, equals to zero, zero or away from criticality, it is a Gaussian distribution. So basically that's, that's all I have. And thank you for your attention. And I think I finished quite early. Uh, thank you, Karen, for this uh, for this talk. Uh, I clap on behalf of the audience. Thank you. Uh, so at the moment there are no questions. So let us wait for for questions to this to this talk. <clears throat> So maybe while people are typing, I will uh, go ahead if that's okay. So thank you very much for your talk. I have a, a couple of questions if, uh, if you don't mind. Sure, sure, sure. So when you talk about uh, the, uh, if I understood what the, or, the original version of the Berriesen uh, theorem. So it's about the fact that um, when you look at the system that are at criticality or above criticality, you expect um, you expect the distribution of energy level to be Gaussian, right? Well, when, whenever you are away from criticality, when you are at criticality, basically the the, the standard barriers and theorem says nothing, and that okay. was the, basically the purpose of, of our work to, to explore I, yes, what I, happens at criticality. I see. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So when you are um, when you are above criticality, so sometimes you can be gapless or orderless, but sometimes you can still remain gapped. Yeah. But in this case, do your considerations still hold or 
Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, ba basically, the thing is that uh, since here uh, we deal with finite temperature phase transitions, basically mm -hmm. the, the presence of the gap is not so, it doesn't change much. Yeah, okay, because, of course. Yes, because we are macroscopically above, above whatever happens at the ground state. Yes, yes. Yes, in, in, in a sense, uh, the, uh, this theorem kind of trivially applies to, to zero temperature case, because basically it says that you are at the ground level. Mm -hmm. And well, I mean, that's, that, that's your distribution, right? It's, it's, yes. It's, it's extremely picked at uh, Okay. And, and I have another question. It's about possible Hamiltonian that uh, do not verify both uh, the original theorem and your theorem. Can, can they exist? Although they have a weight of zero when you consider the whole uh, Hamiltonian ensembles. And so oh, there will okay. be some specific Hamiltonian mm -hmm. that, that weights nothing, but that do not uh, belong to the theorem, in particular some uh, integrable models typically. Uh, oh, well, let, let me think for a second about it. Um, well, I would say that uh, rather no than yes because basically well i mean of, of course of course if, if the hamilton okay so i mean for example things uh, none of these theorems applies for long-range interacting hamiltonians okay and those yeah. those hamiltonians they they are not of measure zero <laughs> rather the opposite right i mean the short-range interacting hamiltonians are of measure zero in in, in a full space of hamiltonians mm -hmm. So in that sense, um, yeah, basically, you, yes, but, like, yeah, short rangedness is, is, is a very strong requirement, yes. But I mean, if I take something very, uh, very stupid, like a Hamiltonian that is always zero, uh -huh. naturally, this, yes. uh, I mean, I guess you can say that it's a Gaussian, but with a zero. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I think this sort of pathological cases can, can be just, again, like described by a pathological Gaussian. And, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. okay. I see, I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one question. Could you, so, so when you were uh, uh, referring to non-critical Bayesian theorem, uh, what's the definition of this J of E? This is not the, uh, the, the, the thing which is associated with the Gaussian. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. It is. It is. A, it is. It is dependent on the state uh, you have. It is not the uh, full distribution of energy levels. But oh. this this is dependent on rho, right? As as this equation shows. Oh yes, sure, sure, sure. So 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 basically, you you have your distribution of energy, and this J E is basically the cumulative distribution of it, right? So so basically, it's the probability of having any energy be below or equal this value E. Right. Uh, so this is the like the actual uh, actual cumulative distribution of energy of your system. Like th that that's what you have in fact, and uh, and well, basically this one is the Gaussian yes, distribution. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, w um, is anything known about um, t equal to infinity case? So where rho is identity matrix. Oh. I, I'm asking because I am uh, doing uh, some things with many model localization when I look at generic eigenstates in the middle of the spectrum. Uh, and usually I get Gaussian de density of states. So uh, I wonder whether there are some uh, more uh, strict uh, results about that. Well, I would say that this, uh, all these reasonings, they, they apply for arbitrarily high temperatures. So, so in principle, in, in principle, t equals to infinity should should also fall fall under this uh, this theorem. Like I, I see no reason that that shouldn't work. So okay. No. So 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 only if I have this uh, condition verified with the exponential decay of the um, correlations between right. uh, sub subregions A and B, then I can expect the Gaussian. Uh, most certainly, yes. Okay. Most certainly. Yes. Oh, so, so in other ways, if I have systems with long range interactions, then it might not be the case. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If 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 the the range of interactions is is not short, <laughs> let's say, then then really, I mean, this theorem says nothing. So, so basically, it can be anything. Yeah, it can be anything. Sure. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, so let us wait a minute for uh, further questions. Mm -hmm. Oh, I suppose we can have a, a small coffee break before yeah. the, the main coffee yeah. break, right? <laughs> That's exactly. So I was about to suggest to Piotr, as a, as a chair, you, you have to, to have the last word, but how about we do an impromptu break of a, of a half an hour and uh, we, we come back with the presentation of uh, Aritra at, uh, at 11 as scheduled. Okay, yeah, that sounds, sounds great, great, great okay. for me. So let's, uh, so le thank you, Karen, again for this nice talk. And uh, okay, so we can reconvene at uh, 11, so in 